Hi, I'm Dr. Hank Lindstrom, pastor of Calvary Community Church and your host on Bible Line Radio. You know, the most important doctrine in the Bible is that of salvation because that's the doctrine that determines whether you go to heaven or go to hell. I want to introduce this doctrine, which I believe will be of great value to you and your friends and family to play again and again to get the basics of the doctrine of salvation firmly into your mind to give you an opportunity to look up the scriptures and mark them, maybe even memorize them, to have the assurance that God wants you to have about your salvation, that you can be sure, absolutely sure of eternal life, and that you cannot lose your salvation, that you're saved once and for all, forever. This is, of course, what will be the foundation of your whole Christian life. So we're going to begin this And at the end, we'll leave some information as to how to contact us if you need further resources or materials that will help you. I pray that this doctrine will be a blessing to you and all that you share it with. I've been asked to speak on how permanent is our salvation, and so we're going to try to look at some of the scriptures that deal with this subject. Why don't we go ahead and begin in the Gospel of John and turn, if you will, to John chapter 5, verse 24, and we'll start here. And if you want to mark down some scriptures as we go along, I think this will be very helpful to understand what salvation is and what it is not, and to find out a little bit more about our assurance. I love to sing blessed assurance and how great it is to be able to know that you are saved, you are a child of God, and that you're eternally saved. And in John 5, 24, this is a wonderful verse. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. What a fantastic verse. We find here several things. First of all, it says that a person who believes on Christ hath everlasting life. Now, in modern English, that would read H-A-S, and it speaks about presently, right now, possessing eternal life. You know, eternal life is not something you get after you die, after God has made an evaluation of your life or your works or whatever. This is generally what the impression is given to so many people that they're going to have to stand before some great judgment where God is going to evaluate their works and maybe put their good works on one side of a scale and their bad works on the other side of a scale and they'll watch which way the scale goes and if they have more good works than bad works they'll get in and if they have more bad works than good works they'll be cast into hell. We know that that is not what the Bible says about eternal life at all. Rather that it's something that has been purchased by Christ's death on the cross and offered completely free to us in this life and we receive it the moment we believe. Salvation is not some process. A lot of people think it's some process where you keep on keeping on and you keep on working toward getting it or acquiring it or keeping it or something else. But God says it's something that you possess presently. Right now I have everlasting life. How do I know? This is one of dozens of verses, and it says here that the person who believes on Christ hath, or has, presently, right now, possesses everlasting life. The next point in verse 24 is that it says, this person shall not come into condemnation or judgment. A person who has trusted Christ, from that point on, he can know that he'll never come into condemnation or judgment. He'll never, ever be sent to hell. And this is great to know, isn't it? You can know that before you ever die, because salvation is on the basis of what Christ has done. And thirdly, it says the person is passed from death into life. At the very instant you believe, you're passed from being spiritually dead unto being spiritually alive. That's the new birth. And it happens the very instant you believe. And by the way, it's irreversible. There is no provision in the Bible whatsoever for being unborn. Once you are born again, There's no provision for you to become unborn any more than you could be unborn physically. Is there any way that any of us could be unborn physically? Absolutely not. Nicodemus, you know, wondered about that when he was told by Christ how that he had to be born again. He said, can I go back into my mother's womb and then be born again? He didn't understand what was going on. And, of course, we know that's physically impossible. And it's also spiritually impossible for a person who's been spiritually born again, passed from death into life, to become unborn. We are saved forever. And our salvation is eternally secure. Here's a statement I use often, which is true. And I think it's a good one to really kind of set the thing in cement or to settle it in your minds where you don't lose it. And that is, if you're not saved forever, you're not saved. 
If you're not saved forever, you're not saved. The only kind of salvation that God offers is eternal salvation. And I think it comes back to an understanding of what salvation that God is offering. He's offering eternal salvation. He completely saves you the moment you trust Him as your Savior. And it's a completed act. You're passed from death into life. You possess eternal life. You'll never come into condemnation the moment you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And that is why a person can know before they die that they have eternal life. Why? Because God has already paid for it. All of our sins, past, present, and future, have been taken care of. Let's look over at John 6 now. We're going to look at several verses in a row here. These are great verses that speak about how you cannot lose it. These I would recommend using. They're some of the most straightforward verses, and I use these particular ones again and again. And uh, in fact, these are the first verses I would turn to if someone thought that they could lose their salvation if they had trusted Christ. In John 6.37, Jesus gives us his promise. He says in John 6.37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That means for no reason or in no instance would he ever cast out anyone that has come to him. So if a person comes to Christ trusting him as their personal Savior, God gives them eternal life. They are saved at that moment. They have eternal life. They'll not come into condemnation. They're passed from death into life. And we find that Christ says, that person I will in no wise cast out. That should settle it right there. But there is always somebody, when I bring this up, that says, well, Christ won't cast me out, but I can cast myself out. You know, this is the next thing that they say. Christ won't cast me out, but if I don't want my salvation that I can turn my back on God or I can do something else and maybe spit on the floor and slide out under the door or something else, I don't know. But uh, they can lose their salvation if they don't want it. Look at verse 39. This makes it impossible even for that. Verse 39 says, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all of which he hath given me, I should lose how many? Nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. So each of us are at least something. And Jesus said, I'm not going to lose any of those that have come unto me, but I'll raise them up again at the last day. Now, what if Jesus had said in this verse, I'm going to lose 100 that come to me? <laughs> or what if I'm going to lose a couple of dozen? Or what if he'd said that I'm going to lose one? If he'd have said that he was going to lose one person, then all of my life I would have to wonder, well, maybe I'm that one, you know? I would always have to have that fear that maybe I'm the one he's going to lose. But I'm glad that Jesus said he was not going to lose one. Now, if one single solitary person who ever trusted Christ ever became lost after he was saved, Jesus Christ himself is a liar. Jesus said here, This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all of which he hath given me, I should lose how many? Nothing, but should raise them up again at the last day. Not one single person who has ever genuinely trusted Christ the Savior will ever be lost. Why? Because God keeps us saved. Jesus promised, I won't lose them. I won't cast them out. And so it's impossible for a person who has genuinely been saved to ever be lost. Look, if you will, at verse 47. This is perhaps one of the most straightforward verses on salvation in all of the Bible. And here it makes very clear the condition for salvation. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, Jesus said, verily, verily, which means truthfully, truthfully. And you might say, well, why did he say truthfully, truthfully? Did Jesus Christ ever lie? Of course not. Does Christ lie? No, he doesn't lie. Then why does he say truthfully, truthfully? Because this is a truth. You may not understand much about the Bible, but this is one truth he doesn't want you to miss. And whenever you see a verily, verily verse, this is an important truth truth. We looked at one in John 5, 24 a moment ago. Here it is again in John 6, 47. This deals with salvation and this is a truth that is not to be gone over lightly. And Jesus said, truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, here it is again, hath, or in modern English, has everlasting life. The moment you trust him. And the word believe means to trust or to rely upon, to put your full confidence in. And the moment you trust Jesus Christ as the one who completely paid for your sin, God says that you have eternal life. You possess it right then. And you know, I was amazed to find this in the Bible because I was always led to believe as a young person that I would have to wait till after I died before I'd ever find out which way I was going to go. 
And there are so many people today that are thinking along these lines because they have never been taught, they have never understood that all of their sins, past, present, and future, have been paid for. Let's look over in Hebrews chapter 10 for just a moment. And we're going to try to see if we can cover a bunch of them today. But in Hebrews chapter 10, we find that in understanding our salvation, I think this is helpful. Once we understand this, I don't think we could lose it because we see that we're eternally secure on the basis of the fact that all of our sins have been forgiven. Look, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 10, where we read here in verse 10, Hebrews 10.10. 10. This is a marvelous passage. And it says here, by the which will referring from the context here to the will of God, by the which will we are sanctified. And by the way, the word sanctified is a $10 word most people don't know the meaning to, but it means simply to make pure and holy. By application, it means to set apart. But the primary meaning of, most Bible teachers talk to you and they'll say it means to be set apart as a primary meaning. That's not true. The primary meaning, the interpretation of the word means to make pure and holy. By application, something that's holy is set apart. But this verse is saying, by the which will or by the will of God, we are sanctified or we are made pure and holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Isn't that a fantastic verse? When Jesus died on that cross, by that one-time death on the cross of Calvary, He makes us pure and holy in His sight. Now, of my works and of my deeds, I'm not holy. I'm a sinner. All have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, Romans 3.10. But when a person trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, because Christ on the cross paid for all of his sin, past, present, and future, at that instant... In the sight of God, that person is seen by God as pure and holy, as though he had committed no sin at all. Verse 11, religion can't do that. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, and notice the last phrase, which can never take away sins. There is no priest, no rabbi, no minister, no man on this earth that can forgive your sin. And religion cannot save you. You can be religious and go to hell. And a lot of times people are surprised to find that out. Religion doesn't save. Salvation is in the person of Jesus. And when you trust him as your savior, he saves you. It goes on in verse 12 and says, But this man, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, after he had offered how many sacrifices? One. For sins, forever, he then sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now notice verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected for how long? He perfects you forever. If you are perfected forever in God's sight, how then could you ever be lost? You can't be. The moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are perfected forever. Isn't that fantastic? For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So we are perfected forever in God's sight the moment we trust Christ. You know, that's mind-boggling when you think about that, that God would see you and me, who are sinners, as absolutely pure and holy, as without sin, perfected forever, the moment we trust Christ. And we go down to verse 17, and it says, And their sins and iniquities will I what? Remember no more. Isn't that great? All of our sins, past, present, and future. Some people have a difficulty understanding, how could Christ have paid for the sins I haven't committed yet? How could he have paid for my future sins? Well, you can ask yourself this simple question, and that is when Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago, how many of your sins were future? All of them. You weren't even born yet. You see, God saw in the future your whole lifetime transpire, and he paid for every sin that you would ever commit in your entire lifetime. That was paid for back at Calvary 2,000 years ago. You weren't born when Jesus died at Calvary. Yet, he saw your lifetime transpire in the future, and he saw every sin that you would ever commit, and they're all paid for, past, present, and future. Maybe that helps clear up something. Because sometimes we get the misconception that Christ pays maybe for the sins up till the time you believe, and then you're on your own. No, no, no. Jesus paid for all of your sins, past, present, and future. And that's why, right here in this life, Right at this very moment, if you've trusted Christ, you can know you're going to heaven. I know my destination now. Let's look back over in the book of Romans for a moment, and here's a couple of verses that are favorites, I think, of everybody, and maybe we don't really think about them enough. In Romans chapter 8, in verses 38 and 39, a couple of my favorites, it says, For I am persuaded 
that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are great verses of assurance. And Paul is saying here in Romans 8, I am persuaded. That in the Greek, the word persuaded means thoroughly convinced. Why was he convinced? Because he had the word of God on it. I am convinced too, because I have God's word. I read in the scriptures that I am forgiven, that I am a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, that I am passed from death into life. I'm not going to come into condemnation. I have eternal life right now. And here it says, I am persuaded or I'm thoroughly convinced that neither death Death can't separate me from going to heaven to be with the Lord. Nor can life, nothing in my life can do that. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, which speaks of the unseen powers of Satan and his angels. And it says, nor things present, nothing present in my life could ever cause me to be lost. Nor anything to come in my life, nothing in my future could ever affect the salvation that I have. Isn't that great to know? Nothing in my future, nothing that's to come could ever affect my salvation. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation, should read, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Once you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are eternally secure. Now what about a person who says, well, I can lose my salvation? If a person says that they can lose their salvation, they are most generally trusting in their works. And this is one of the most deceitful things for that type of a person because they don't recognize that they're trusting in works and most probably, therefore, they're not saved because they have not trusted in Christ alone and so therefore they are not a saved person. I'll give you an illustration. I've talked to a person, a young man. You have to learn new questions to ask people today because a lot of questions have been running the ground as far as witnessing is concerned. I never ask a person anymore, are you a Christian? Why? Because people look at you kind of funny and they say, what do you think I am, Chinese? That term has been so used and misused, it's kind of lost its significance and meaning. Everybody thinks that if they were born in America, that makes them a Christian, because supposedly this was a Christian nation, so I was born in America. Well, being born in a garage wouldn't make you an automobile, would it? Of course not. That doesn't follow at all, but people have this illogical type of thinking. And so, I really don't use that question anymore. I ask them, where would you go if you were to die? That's generally one that they haven't heard before. And they usually don't have an answer for that one, and unless they're genuinely saved, usually. Well, I talked to this young man, and I said, where are you going to go when you die? He said, heaven. I said, how do you know? He says, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Okay, that sounds real great, right up to there. And if I'd have left it there, I would assume that this young man knew the Lord as his Savior. But I said now, and I knew a little bit of his background, and I said, now, if from this point on, you stopped going to church, I knew he was going to church, and I said, you stopped reading your Bible, stop praying, stop living for Christ or whatever, and maybe began to live a different kind of life, maybe began to hit the bars and, and live a disobedient life, and then you were to die, where would you go? He said, oh, I'd go to hell. I said, you're trusting in your works for your salvation, and you're not saved. He says, what do you mean? I'm not trusting in my works. I said, you're telling me how you live your life from right here, here you are right now, you claim to be saved, and over here is the day you die. You're telling me that how you live your life between here and here is what's going to determine your eternal destiny. You're telling me if you continue to live the Christian life between point A here when you say you're saved and over here point B when you die, you'll go to heaven. That if you don't live the Christian life between point A and point B, that you'll go to hell. You're telling me that your whole eternal destiny is determined on how you live your life between these two points. You're trusting in your works for salvation and you're not saved. And I'll never forget his comment as a young 21-year-old or so. He said, that's heavy, man. Yeah, that's heavy. He says, I'm going to have to think about that. And so he wrestled with it all that night. And the next day I talked to him again. And he trusted Christ as Savior. He said, you know, I have been trusting living the Christian life to get me to heaven. Well, the Christian life doesn't save you. You're saved by Jesus Christ's death on the cross. And that alone. And it's important to understand the difference. And it's true that we should not live a life that's opposed to the will of God after we're saved. We'll talk about what God will do if we do live that kind of a way. But salvation is based upon purely what Jesus Christ has done. And if you trust in Christ here, you're saved forever. Nothing in your life, nothing in your death, angels, principalities, nothing. Nothing in your future could ever undo that relationship that has been made when you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. And there are many people 
who are confused over this whole thing. Let's look over in Matthew chapter 7, and why do I bring all this up, and why do I make such a point out of it? I think this is important to recognize, because there are many people who name the name of Jesus Christ who are not saved because they're trusting in living the Christian life, or in their works, or in some efforts that they're doing in order to obtain their salvation. In Matthew chapter 7, I read it often because it so moves me to make sure that I present the gospel clearly when I talk to someone. We're not splitting hairs here. We're talking about a person's eternal salvation is in the balance as to whether or not he's trusted Jesus Christ alone or whether he's trusting in his works. And in Matthew 7 and verse 22, Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That's in the name of Jesus Christ. And in thy name have cast out devils. They've done works of healing in Jesus' name. And in thy name, the name of Jesus Christ, have done many wonderful works. And Jesus says in verse 23, And then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now notice, he didn't say, I once knew you and now you're lost. I once knew you and I lost you. We know already, we've already found out that Christ will not lose one person who has ever trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. These were persons who were never saved. Did they talk about Jesus? Yes. Did they preach about Jesus? Hand up tracts? Absolutely. It says, Lord, haven't we preached or prophesied in your name? They even did works of healing in the name of Jesus Christ. They did good deeds. They helped the poor and others. There was many deeds done by these people, many good works. In the name of Jesus Christ, and Christ said, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now what was the problem here? These people, not one of them said, Lord, didn't we trust that you died on the cross of Calvary and shed your precious blood there to pay for my sin, and that you were buried and that you came back again from the dead? If they had said that, he would have said, come right on into heaven. See, they were trusting in living the Christian life for their salvation. They were trusting in their good works. And you know, the Bible tells us that whenever you're trusting in your works for salvation, that that trusting in works is sin. Jesus called their good works in Jesus' name, he called it iniquity. He called their preaching in Jesus' name iniquity, because why? They were trusting it to get them to heaven. If you are trusting in your good works or your good deeds to enter into heaven, God calls it sin or iniquity. Isn't that incredible? So, what we're talking about is that there's a satanic warfare for the minds and the souls of men. Satan wants to blind people, and Satan works in such a way that he presents a heavenly way to go to hell. He caused people to think they're on their way to heaven because they try to be religious, and he even gets them to try to live the Christian life without being saved, and trusting the Christian life to get them to heaven when it will never save them. They must trust Jesus alone. Turn to Isaiah 64. This one is another shocker that perhaps you're already familiar with. Hopefully you are, but let's think about it again. In Isaiah 64, 6, this one, when I first saw it, amazed me because these were surprises for me. I didn't realize that the Bible said some of these things. In Isaiah 64, 6, when it talks about us as an unsaved person, it says in Isaiah 64, 6, We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags. Now, it says here in Isaiah 64, 6, that not our sins are filthy rags, but God says that our righteous deeds, same thing we read in Matthew 7, 22, that if a man is going to trust in his righteous deeds to enter into heaven, God is going to see it simply as a pure pile of filthy rags. It will not get him in. And I'm talking about righteous deeds. I'm talking about a person can try to live a good holy life live for the Lord and all these things and if he's trusting in that kind of life to get him to heaven he'll go to hell he must recognize that he's a sinner that he's an unclean thing that his best righteousnesses are filthy rags in the sight of God and purely trust Jesus Christ alone for his salvation and this is what we're talking about is the nitty gritty of what salvation is and what it is not and it's so important to be able to know the difference turn if you will now over to the book of Romans to chapter 11 some of you out here might be saying, That's, this is all heavy, man. This is, I haven't heard some of these things before. I can understand. Romans chapter 11, notice verse 6. And this is kind of a tongue twister, but if you grasp the truth of this verse, you've got a lot under your belt. In Romans 11:6, it says, If by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. 
But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You say, ah, what did he say? It's uh, kind of a confusing verse on the surface as you look at it. But what it's simply saying here is that grace and works are extreme opposites. In fact, by definition, grace is the absence of any works. If you were to graph them, you would have to put grace at infinity this way, and you would have to put works at infinity this way. They are opposites. Maybe I can help get you to see this by showing you two other opposites. I'll put two other opposites in this verse. If it's daytime, then it cannot be nighttime. Otherwise, daytime wouldn't be daytime. Everybody follow that? And if it's nighttime, then it can't be daytime. Otherwise, nighttime wouldn't be nighttime. In other words, it can't be daytime and nighttime at the same time. Everybody with me? It's impossible. By definition, it can't be daytime and nighttime at the same time. Okay, if it's daytime, it can't be nighttime. Otherwise, daytime isn't daytime. What it's saying here in Romans 11, 6 is if you're saved by grace, which is God's unmerited favor, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, you have violated the definition of grace. You don't have grace. You're either saved by grace or you attempt to be saved by your works. If you attempt to be saved by your works, Christ will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work what? Iniquity, because our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Or you trust the Lord Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. As Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me. And when you trust Jesus alone as your Savior, God saves you at that instant. You're eternally saved. Notice the second phrase of this verse. And this one, of course, just like an arrow goes through my heart as I think about this for those who are trusting in both. It says, if it be of works, then it is no more grace. If a person is trusting in any works for his salvation, plus Jesus, it says here that he'll have no grace or no mercy when he stands before God. And so what we're talking here, as I said a moment ago, is not splitting a hair. We're talking about what salvation is and what it isn't. And if you're not saved forever, you're not saved. The only kind of salvation that God offers is eternal salvation. He saves you eternally. And it's not on the basis of what we have done because we have nothing to offer God. God says we're sinners. We're corrupt. But we needed a Savior, and Jesus came as that Savior, God in flesh, and He made a payment for our sin, whereby upon accepting Him as our Savior, we become His. And He's paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. It's all taken care of. And, of course, the problem comes up then, well, doesn't that lead to a license to sin? I'm always asked that. You mean if you preach that why people will just go out and they'll murder and rob and steal and they'll do all kinds of things and that's just a license to live as they please. No. You know, once a person trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, all of a sudden they become born into a new family and all of a sudden for the first time they have a, a father, a heavenly father. Do you know that if you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God is not your father? The Bible says God is your creator. But he does not become your father until you've had the new birth, until you're born into his family as a child of his. Anyone who is unsaved who prays, Our Father which art in heaven, is praying incorrectly, because God is not his father. He's praying an empty, worthless prayer. God is not his father. But when you have the new birth, when you're passed from death into life, and you've entered the family of God by faith, then God becomes your father for the very first time. And then you can pray properly, Our Father or My Father in Heaven, because He then is your Father. And then as having a Heavenly Father, God does not allow us to get away with living as we please. The Christian will never be sent to hell. But if we live disobediently as a Christian, we can expect that God will interfere and that He'll chastise and He will make us pretty miserable if He wants to about that and He'll try everything He can to straighten us up. So let's look over to the book of Hebrews again. In Hebrews chapter 10, I always have people ask me, well, what about backsliding? Can't you backslide? Yes, they're backsliders. Let's talk a little bit about them for a minute. And we'll talk about what God does with backsliders. You know, this robs people of assurance. I hear one man came to me not too long ago and he said that he heard a message on backsliding and he says, I guess I've backslid right out of my salvation. And I've lost my salvation. And he was really serious about that, really upset and concerned. And I said, let me show you a verse. And here's the one we looked at. And it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The Lord certainly will not be pleased. But verse 39, But 
we, and the Christian is one who's being spoken of here, the writer of Hebrews, whoever you might think he was, is obviously including himself, and he's saved, and he's speaking to the saved here. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, or hell, or backslide into hell, but of them that believe to the what? Saving of the soul. When a Christian gets away from the Lord, and is disobedient, yes, he can draw back away from the Lord, or he can backslide, but notice verse 39, it says, But we are not of them who draw back into hell with perdition. Perdition is hell. You can never backslide into hell. Isn't that great to know? It says, But we are of those that believe to the saving of the soul. The soul is completely saved when you trust Christ as your Savior. All right, well, what does God do then to a backsliding Christian? You can backslide, yes. And you might want to mark these down because these are good to know because when somebody talks about backsliding into hell, here's your answer right here. Because we are not of those who draw back or backslide back into hell. We cannot. But we are those who believe to the saving of the soul. We'll turn over to chapter 12, and it's all throughout here in Hebrews. We'll turn to chapter 12 of Hebrews in the sixth verse. And here's the answer. And every Christian ought to have this at his fingertips because when you're witnessing, people are going to say, I can't accept that because that means I could live as I please. You need to say, once you trust Christ, it's true. No matter what you do, you would still be saved. But God is going to spank you if you're going to be delinquent. Notice verse 6 of chapter 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. All right. Now notice it's not talking about everybody in the whole wide world, but every son. Only those that have trusted Christ are God's sons or God's children. You know, when I was raised at home with my mom and dad, and whenever I was disobedient, my mom and dad never ever kicked me out of the house when I was disobedient. They never said, son, you're through. We're kicking you out. We're bolting the door. We never want to see your face again. My dad and mom never did that. In fact, when I disobeyed and was disobedient, my dad would often stand at the front door with the door wide open and his arms outstretched and said, son, get into the house. Get into the bedroom. And he'd even tell me which direction to lay over the bed as he'd take off his belt and give me a warm welcome. Uh, my dad never kicked me out, but my father dealt with me as to what I had done. Well, you know, our Heavenly Father is the same way. He doesn't kick us out and say, I'm going to lose you. Uh, you've been disobedient. But rather, our Heavenly Father says, come here, son. You've been disobedient. And the Lord says that he can chastise. He says he chastises and scourges every son whom he receives. It goes on and says in verse 8, If you be without chastisement, whereof all, A-L-L, all of God's children are partakers, then you are illegitimate, a little stronger word there in the King James, and not sons. God says here, if you could go out and live a rebellious life and just do anything you pleased, and God didn't interfere in any way, it would prove that you were not saved. God says that when you become my child, I'm not going to allow you to be delinquent anymore. I'm going to interfere as to how you live your life. I will not cast you out. I will not lose you. I will not send you to hell. But I can sure spank you. I can sure correct you. And he goes on down and he talks about this further in verse 11. He says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Notice, but it says, but grievous. It's not a pleasant experience to get a spanking. I never remember when my dad beat me and said, Dad, that was terrific. Would you do it again tomorrow night? I, I never did that. It's a grievous experience. But notice the verse 11 where it says, Nevertheless, afterward it does what? It yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. I remember that after I was spanked that I would always be very respectful of my dad. Yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. <laughs> I would be very responsive to whatever he asked me to do. <laughs> Carry out the garbage, yes, sir, right away. And uh, it was very, very respectful and brought about a peaceable righteousness in my life when my dad exercised discipline on me. Well, the same thing is true of our Heavenly Father. And he does deal in our life after we are saved. Now, this is important, I think, to recognize. God does not give us the license to live as we please. If we were to sin willfully, God says we're still saved. But he says that he will certainly chastise and he'll deal in our life. And we can lose the joy of our salvation. We can lose that close fellowship we can have with the Lord. We can lose rewards. We can lose the power in our Christian life. We can lose uh, all of these things, but we can never lose our salvation, which God has given to us eternally. Let's go on now over to Ephesians chapter 1 now. 
I'd like to spend a lot of time on each one of these particular doctrines. For lack of time, we're just going to skim a lot of things here. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 13, this is a most remarkable verse. It says, In whom ye also trusted, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, and let me make a note here, if you have a reference Bible like the Schofield, you read in the margin, the King James gives you a wrong sense here. You think that it's talking about something that happens as a subsequent act of believing here, but in the Greek, it's talking about a simultaneous act. In the middle of the verse there where it says, and also after that you believed, should read, and if you have a Schofield in the margin, it'll read, having believed you were. In other words, simultaneously with belief. This is something that happens the moment you believe. Notice it says here, and it should read if you look in your margin, having believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. When a person trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, simultaneously with the trust in Christ, he is sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Now what does this mean? You know, in the Old Testament, a seal was a sign of a finished transaction. It was used when a king would send a letter to some dignitary or whatever. He would write whatever he wanted to on the scroll. He would roll it up and then they would seal the edge of it with wax. And then the king would take his ring with a certain insignia on there and he would press it into the wax. And then that letter was sent to whom it was addressed. And nobody but nobody better open that letter except to whom it was addressed. That God has put upon us. God seals a believer as his very own the moment you trust Christ as Savior. The instant you believe you are sealed by God. And the interesting thing is we're not sealed with wax. The seal is the Holy Spirit, God Himself. Isn't that amazing? If you were to ever be lost, someone or something would have to be more powerful than God Himself to break the seal because the seal is God. The seal is the Holy Spirit, God Himself, who comes to indwell inside of our bodies. That kind of makes it impossible to be lost, doesn't it? God says, I am sealing you as my very own child. And nothing is going to be able to undo this relationship and this transaction that has taken place. Also in verse 14 it goes on to say, And this seal, the Holy Spirit, is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. The word earnest there, you know what the word means. It means a down payment. It's used in, still in legal terms and in real estate. If you were to buy a house, you'd put down a down payment, an earnest payment, a payment in earnest that you're going to complete the deal. And God is saying that I am giving you the Holy Spirit in advance of your being in heaven and walking those golden streets, but I'm giving you the Holy Spirit not only to seal you, but also as a down payment signifying that I'm going to complete the transaction and you're going to be in heaven with me shortly, one of these days. You know, if God were not to follow through, He would have to forfeit to us the down payment, wouldn't He? Just like in a business transaction. And if that happened, that would mean if we went to hell and we were lost and we went to hell, then the Holy Spirit would have to go to hell with us. That'll never happen, friend. God the Holy Spirit is not going to go to hell. And God the Holy Spirit has come to seal us until we're present with the Lord in heaven. And He is the down payment that God has given to us, signifying that He's going to complete our salvation. So it's impossible for a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ to ever be lost. Isn't that great? When I sing Blessed Assurance, it has all new meaning for me because I used to sing that as an unsaved person, wishing that that were true for me, you know? As I think back as a, as a young person, I used to sing that in church, and, and I thought, boy, isn't that great? And, and I wished that it could be true for me and never knew that if I would trust the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, I would be saved and that I could have this blessed assurance to know that I'm saved, to know that I'm going to heaven. And what great peace that brings in your mind to know that it's settled that you're on your way to heaven and that's taken care of. You don't have to give that any thought anymore. Now that you can devote your attention to pleasing the Lord and going about the business that He'd have you to do, which is winning the lost and training them up and discipling them and nurturing them after they have trusted Christ. Well, we find that this is just one of dozens and dozens of verses in the Word of God that make clear that you can certainly never be lost once you are saved. All right, let's get back now to John chapter 10. Here's another one I definitely want to cover. This one's a fantastic one. In the Gospel of John, in the 10th chapter, in verse 28, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 
There's a fantastic book that's been written by the title that came out of this verse that I'd recommend it to you if you have a problem with doctrine of security. It's called Shall Never Perish. It came out of this verse written by a man named Strombeck, S-T-R-O-M-B-E-C-K. He was a Christian layman, toy manufacturer, who lived for the Lord, and he's written a masterpiece on this particular doctrine. But anyway, it says here, I given to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And we find here, it says, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We find here that Christ says, I give them eternal life, not temporary life, a probation period, a trial period, you know, 10-day trial, see if it works out. No. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. And then thirdly, he says, neither shall any. And the word man is in italics. That means it's not in the original. It was added by the translators. Whenever you see an italicized word, I used to think it was there for emphasis. Little did I realize that later I found out the translators added it. It was not in the original. And oftentimes, rather than making the sense clear as they intended to do, they just limit the sense of the verse as it would limit it here. Neither shall any, any, pluck them out of my hand. If you just say man, that would limit it only to man plucking you out of his hand. But Jesus is saying here, neither shall any. That would include Satan or any other creature or anything could be able to pluck us out of his hand. In other words, once you're saved, you're in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can't be lost. You know, when I was small, this is what makes it clear to me, when I was small and I can remember oftentimes going grocery shopping with my mom or my dad and we'd be downtown or something in very busy streets or whatever. And I always would like to hold on to my mom or dad's hand, but I didn't like it when they held on to my hand. But you know, when we came to a very busy intersection or a very busy street, my mom or my dad would reach down and they wouldn't let me hold on to them, they would hold on to me. Why? Because they knew that sometimes I would let go and do my own thing as a child. But if they were holding on to me, there was no way I was going to get loose. And sometimes I say, Mom, my hand's turning blue. <laughs> my hand's going to come off. Oh, and you know how sometimes you have to hold on to a kid real tight when you're going across a, a busy intersection or a street. But, you know, this is really what it's talking about here. When you've trusted Christ as your Savior, God gives you eternal life. You'll never perish. And you're held by His hand. You're in His hand. You're not holding on to Him. You know, some people don't. We're holding on. Keep holding on to Christ. And if you just keep holding on to Him, maybe you'll make it someday. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach we're holding on to Him. The Bible teaches that He's holding on to us. Isn't that great? He's got a hold of us. And there's no way you're going to be able to break that grip. And then I love in verse 29 where it goes on to say, My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now here it says in verse 29, you're in the Father's hand. It says, first of all, in verse 28, you're in the Lord Jesus Christ's hand. In verse 29, it says you're in the Father's hand. And then look at verse 30. As Jesus explains that, he says, I and my Father are one. You're really in the same hand. Jesus is God. And so we are eternally and doubly secure. We're in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're in the hand of the Father, and they're one and the same. And so He's holding us. Somebody once said that God's got a hold of you, and you can wiggle, and you can do all you want to try to get away, but you can't get away. You're stuck. He's got a hold on you. And how true that is. One lady came up to a person and was using this verse to point out security to her pastor. And she said, I'm secure because I'm in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this unbelieving pastor who believed you could lose your salvation said, but you must be careful or you might be able to slip out through the fingers. And this dear saint knew enough to say, oh pastor, that could never be true because according to the word of God, I am the fingers. You know, it says in Ephesians 4 that we become when we trust Christ, the members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And so if we were to ever be lost, a part of Jesus Christ would actually have to be cut off because we become such an integral part of the body of Christ that we are the fingers. You can't slip out through the fingers because you are the fingers as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are eternally saved, eternally secure. Does it lead to a license to sin? No, not at all. In fact, you know, it's amazing how it has a reverse reaction oftentimes person who recognizes they were undeserving, held down, and God loved them enough to save them in that condition is oftentimes so grateful that they want to live for the Lord. They want to serve Him. And it brings about great service. 
It's the confusion in this area that causes people not to know what to do and confused about it. And we have no right to change what God has said, no matter what we might think the outcome might be. You know, sometimes people say, well, I don't want to teach that doctrine because I think it would lead to such and such and such. We have no right to change God's plan of salvation. God has stated that we're saved by grace, which is unmerited favor, through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. It's that simple. God has said it. I believe it. That settles it. I hope you enjoyed the doctrine of salvation. And I hope you have trusted Christ as your Savior. And if you haven't, you could bow your head right now and just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus Christ died and paid for my sins in full at the cross, was buried and rose again from the dead. And I trust Jesus Christ right now as my only means of heaven, as my Savior, as the one who died to forgive my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. I trust Jesus Christ right now to give me the gift of eternal life. The moment you trust him, God up in heaven knows that he saves you and you're saved eternally. Now you're faced with a second decision that's to live for Christ and that'll bring about rewards and blessings in your life. And there may be things that you might want to get to help you. You can write to us here at Calvary Community Church by writing to us at 4811 George Road, Tampa, Florida, the zip code being 33634. That's 4811 George Road, Tampa, Florida, 33634. Also, you can telephone us at 813-884-4328. That's 813-884-4328. Also, we have a website address. It's BibleLineMinistries.org. BibleLineMinistries.org. And hopefully we can be a resource for you as you grow and your understanding of the gospel and as you learn how to present it to others. And uh, we have a book that we particularly recommend called Handbook of Personal Evangelism. This book will basically tell you how to open your mouth and how to share the gospel in a way that a person that you're talking to will understand it and then how to close it down and bring that conversation to a close and lead that person to Christ. It will also establish you in your faith and let you have full assurance that the Bible is the Word of God and that you're truly saved by faith in Christ and that you can never be lost, but that what is now in your focus is the Christian life and rewards and blessings here and now and in eternity. I'm Dr. Hank Lindstrom. 4811 George Road, Tampa, Florida. We'll be praying for you. I trust that you have already received Christ as your Savior by trusting Him as the only hope you have of reaching heaven and are now in pursuit of living for Him, not to be saved, but because you are and because you'd like to have others know about this great message of salvation through faith in Christ.